Well, good morning. A great day to be in God's house, a great day to worship our Lord, our Savior, and so excited about today and what God's teaching us. And this morning, we come to the conclusion of a really great series. It's been a great series called Perspective. And the series has been walking through the Old Testament and this book called Zephaniah, and it's just so good. It's deep and it's rich. And I've loved what God's teaching us. You know, a lot of times you come to the Old Testament, a lot of people think, Oh, the Old Testament, you know, it's so boring, right? Or the Old Testament, man, God's always angry or God's always mad. And, and I pray that in this series, we're, we're maybe changing that perspective a little bit, that you understand that the Old Testament is, is not irrelevant. The Old Testament is setting the table for the New Testament. The Old Testament is preparing our hearts for what God is going to do in sending His Son, the Messiah, the salvation of the world. And in the Old Testament, we really see the depth and the nature of God. We start to learn who God is and what God wants to do. Now, back in the Old Testament, God would send people called prophets, right? And that's what we're studying with uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah was one of those prophets around 640 to 610 BC in Jerusalem. And God sent this prophet, Zephaniah, to the people of Jerusalem. He said, hey guys, you're complacent in your spiritual walk. You know, you're not excited about me. You've kind of lost that. And you're worshiping these other gods, little G, the gods of the land, like Baal and Ashtaroth and Molech. And so God says, hey, here's my prophet, Zephaniah, go speak to the people and call them back to me. And in Zephaniah chapter 1, that's what we saw, that Zephaniah identifies the sin, he identifies the complacency among God's people. And Zephaniah says, guys, come back to God. God's the one who's blessed us. God's the one who's given us all of this. And, and yet our hearts are wandering. I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, right? Prone to leave the God I love. And we, we said in Zephaniah chapter 1 that that's us many times. Uh, many times we get consumed with the world. We get caught up in the materialism or other idols come into our life and we have other gods and, and God calls us out through the power of his Holy Spirit and says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I love you. In Zephaniah chapter 2 is this call to repentance, this call to confession. And a lot of times we hear the word confession and our perspective is, oh no, I'm in trouble, right? Oh man, I've blown it. Or maybe you grew up Catholic and we think about immediately the confessional booth and that's in our mind and then we just have these, you know, ah, those feelings well up inside of us. But what we've seen is confession, it's beautiful, that God doesn't give up on us. And we said the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is apathy. And God's not apathetic toward us, God cares about us. So God prompts our hearts and says, hey, I see where you're going, I see the way you're drifting, come back to me, draw back to me. And so this beautiful part of confessing and saying, God, you know, I've, I've kind of been lazy spiritually, or God, I've gotten off track here, or God, I've made, you know, these other things my gods, and this call to confession, this call to repentance, repentance, I'm headed one way, I come back to God. And today we're going to see Zephaniah chapter 3. And Zephaniah chapter 3 is one of my favorite passages of scriptures in Zephaniah 3. It's so good, and it talks about the joy of redemption. And like the Old Testament prophets would follow this threefold pattern of this identifying sin, this call to repentance, and then the joy of redemption. When you and I, we reorder our lives around God's plans, around God's purposes, and God says, watch what I will do. Watch what's going to happen in your life. As I bring redemption, as I bring hope, as I bring peace, trust me, the best is yet to be. And we're going to see that today unfold in Zephaniah chapter 3. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah is Old Testament. Somebody told me, they said, the best part of the series has been that I can find the book of Zephaniah. And I said, way to go, you know. I'm glad you got that part. Uh, you know, but it's exciting. So maybe you've got an iPad, you got an iPhone, you got something that you can pull up the scriptures in. Zephaniah, Old Testament, you got Habakkuk, Zephaniah. He's called the forgotten prophet anyway, right? So, so he kind of gets forgotten a lot of times. But I'm proud of you, church. I'm proud of you for, you know, swimming in the deep end. You know, we could always stay in the shallow end, but man, we're venturing out to the deep end of God's word and we're really seeing the depth of God's love and the richness of his truth and what God's doing in our lives. Um, and I love that. Uh, Zephaniah's name, by the way, it means buried treasure, buried treasure. And so I want you to think about that this morning as we walk through Zephaniah 3. Think about this, that God would send a man named, hi, I'm buried treasure, you know, and he would say this to the people because what we're going to find in Zephaniah 3 really is a treasure. I mean, it is unbelievable, the depth and the love and the grace that we receive in God. So pick up here, Zephaniah 3, verse 1. He says, woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled, she obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. 
Now, if you go back to Zephaniah 2, Zephaniah is calling out the, kind of the enemies of Israel, right? He talked about the Philistines, the Moabites, the Amorites, and, you know, the Assyrians, you know, all these different people uh, who were warring against him. He said, whoa, 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 you warning to you guys, don't rebel against God. And now he comes to Zephaniah 3 and he turns the attention onto God's people. And so he says, woe to you, God's people here in Jerusalem, right? Woe to you. Listen, uh, you don't accept correction. And even though God has sent me to you, even though God is speaking to you, you're still worshiping these foreign gods. You're still going this direction. And she does not, right, trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. But Zephaniah's call is to come back to God. And he keeps saying, hey, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. I mean, that's an Old Testament truth. That's a New Testament revelation. You know, as you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. And so he's wooing the people back. And God's saying, I'm not giving up on you. And I love that about God. You know, even when we sin, even when we blow it, even when we mess up, God's still saying, hey, I'm drawing you back. I'm calling you back. I'm inviting you back. And we see that in the heartbeat of God. And now look over in verse 9 of Zephaniah chapter 3. He says this revelation. First of all, he says, God is your rescuer. God is this, your rescuer. Look at verse 9. Then will I purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. Isn't that beautiful? Then I may purify the lips of the people that they may call out to me. They may call. In the New Testament, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That even in our total depravity, even when we're away from God, when we call out, God comes to our rescue. God will redeem. God will restore. In 2001, I took a mission team to Moscow, and uh, we were standing there in Red Square. Really an eerie feeling, right? I mean, I grew up kind of uh, like the Cold War, and it was so strange to be there in, in Red Square. But, but I'm standing there, and we have our team there, and we have a pastor who's with us, and this pastor was like pastoring an underground church under communism. So the guy had been in prison, the guy had been beaten for his faith, and you know when Perestroika came in, in 1990, and, and freedom came, and the church came up from underground, uh, but we were standing there, and we were, we were talking, and he said, Jeff, look around. He said, have you noticed that nobody smiles? I said, yeah. I said, that was weird. We were on the subway the first day, and I'm looking around. I'm trying to talk to people, and I can't speak Russian, so that didn't go real well anyway. But nobody was smiling, you know, and I'm used to a place where everybody's friendly, and we're talking. But he said, yeah. He said, nobody smiles. And he said, you know, it, it's, it's, it's dark, and it's dreary. He said, but think about this. He said, Mother Russia, we have more natural resources than any place in the world. You imagine we have more natural resources than any other country. And yet under communism, what do we do? Under communism, we said, God is dead. Forget about God. And he goes, I really believe that God just pulled his hand of blessing away from us. And he goes, and this is what you get. It's dark. It's dreary. He said, but I have to tell you, there's a group of people who believe in God. And he said, God is doing something in the church today here in Russia. He said, I'm more excited about what God is doing today than ever before. He said, God is moving and God is working. And I was just standing there getting excited for him and for what God was doing there. Just thinking about the remnant of the people who are calling out to God. And I was like, yes. And I think that's what God is saying to the people in Jerusalem at that time. He's like, hey guys, listen, I know you've been far from God, but, but come back. Come back, and as you call out to God, God will rescue. God will come through, and you'll stand shoulder to shoulder. I love that line, you know. We stand shoulder to shoulder serving God. It's like, I love, it's the church, right? We all have different gifts. We all have different talents, but we're standing shoulder to shoulder. We're serving God in our day, in our generation. We're giving our best for his glory, and God says, this is what I'm doing among you. I'm doing a new work of redemption. He says, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring the offerings. He's like, you know, even in places of exile, even in places of hard time, I, I'm still with you. And you'll come and respond to me and you won't come empty handed. You'll come with joy in your hearts. On that day, you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me. Wow. So many times we come to God, we think God's just waiting, you know, to go, all right, you know, come on back. And what we're gonna find is condemnation. What we're going to find is like, man, you're in trouble. You've blown it. And he's like, no, 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 no. On that day, you will not be put to shame. 
for all the wrongs you've done to me because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I, I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord. Right? That remnant, the people who get it, the people who are passionate about God. And it says in the New Testament, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The proud, people who say, I don't need God. I'll do it on my own, <laughs> right? But the humble, the people who say, you're God and I'm not, and I recognize at a point in my life, man, I need you, God. I need your help because I was in sin. I was in, in depravity. And Father, you came to me. You rescued me. Those who trust in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel! Exclamation point. Can you feel it building? Can you feel the excitement? Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. Your hands hang limp. You're passive. He said, no, no, no. On that day, you're just going to worship. On that day, you're going to be so excited. You're just going to go, praise be to God. Praise be to God, for he is our rescuer, our redeemer, our restorer. The one who makes all things new, the one who makes all things right, praise be to God. Have you ever thought in your life as you look back over, hindsight's 2020, isn't it? And you look back over your life and you, you see the way God's taken care of you in the past. You see the way God's come through. I remember being a kid in school and like I didn't study for a test, you know what I'm saying? And you're just like, God, please help me. You know, I'll eat my vegetables or whatever. And somehow, you know, God just came through every time. I don't know how, but I made it through, you know. And each time, it's like, as we look back, God's been faithful. God's been faithful. And yet we live in a world of fear, right? We're, we're always afraid. We're afraid of terrorism. We're afraid of the stock market that could crash. We're afraid of the housing bubble could burst. We're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid, we're afraid, we're afraid. And God says to his people, listen, when you find your worth and your value in me, when you understand that I am there for you, you don't have to be afraid. I mean, three times, right? And no one will make them afraid. <laughs> right? Never again will you fear any harm. Do not fear. Praise be to a God who says, hey, I want to take away that fear. Can you imagine the perspective of living if you didn't have to live with fear? Can you imagine living and you're just like, I don't have to be stressed out all the time. I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be anxious because my God's in control. My God's going to come through. My God's been there for me in the past. He's going he's to come through. I know it. I live it. I believe it. And that's what God's saying to his people back then. And that's what God's saying to us today. I am your rescuer, your redeemer, your restorer, your defender, your shield. I am your God. This morning, I want you to hear from Kent and Vonda. And Kent Vincent is our new executive pastor. And we are so glad that Kent is here. Uh, they just moved from Jackson, Mississippi last Saturday and got the moving truck in. And it's been a crazy week, closing on the house and everything. But uh, they are just amazing, amazing people. And Kent, we're, we're just pumped. We've been praying for you for over a year. And now you're here. And uh, what a difference you're going to make. And how's the transition? How are you doing? It's been great. It's been really busy. Um, transition's been happening, feels like, for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but this week has been crazy. We've got the, we're at the stage now with the boxes in the house where we're just, everything's unpacked. You look at these boxes and go, why is this here and how are we going to use it in this house <laughs> is where we are right now. But we're pumped uh, to be at Rolling Hills. We're excited. Uh, I'm excited to work with Jeff, mm -hmm. and I, I love the team. One of the markers when I walked in the first time, I heard laughter, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, I, laughter in church is a good thing. There's great joy. Um, you have made us feel very at home, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we've got a 15-year-old daughter. Uh, soft, middle of sophomore year, that's a tough transition for her, and uh, the student ministry and the interns and just the staff, you guys have made this feel like home very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So just thank you for that, and we're really excited about what God is doing mm -hmm. and uh, what the future of Rolling Hills holds. I love it, Kent. So thankful. And Vonda, 
we talk about God as our rescuer, and, and that's, that's a phrase that just resonates with you, with your family, and tell us about your family and your kids. Okay. Um, all three of our kids are miracles. Uh, we went through five and a half years of infertility treatments to get pregnant with our daughter, Katie, mm. and even during the pregnancy, we had a couple of scares, but we just knew that the enemy was trying to steal our joy, and we weren't going to let him, and that's how we got her middle name of Joy. Her name is Katie Joy. And even um, after we had her, we, you know, we wanted a, a big family. And so we went through more infertility treatments, but it began to take a toll on me physically. So we came to, to the conclusion that this was the family that God gave us. And we were going to be happy with that. But every night she would pray for a little brother or a little sister. And we just said, God, if that's what you have for us, we're going to need you to drop that in our laps. And he did. Um, Katie was seven years old, and we found out through some friends at our church in Houston, Texas, about um, a ministry that Youth with a Mission has in downtown Houston. And they call them rescue families. They need rescue families to take in these children that were living on the streets with their homeless parents. And um, a single parent, not, you know, they weren't taken away from a family. But, mm. uh, and we said we would do that. And our first meeting with the people from YWAM, they told us about a, a different situation they'd never had before where the birth mom was in jail for uh, drugs and prostitution. And she was going to deliver a son. She had already named him Isaiah in December. I mean, I'm sorry, in October, but she didn't get out till December. So she needed a rescue family to take him in for two months. And we said we would, wow. and we did. We took him into our homes. It was love at first sight. <laughs> and on December 13th of 2005, we had to leave him at a homeless shelter with his birth mom. And she had him there for 10 days, and the drugs were just too big of a demon in her life, and she walked out and abandoned him two days before Christmas. Um, through a miracle of God, the uh, Child Protective Services found my phone number with her belongings and called us. But we were told that because we had not gone through the state and we're not licensed with them, that there's no way that we would get him back. But, um, but God, you know, we knew that he was ours and we were going to fight for him. That was the call he'd put on us. So we went to court with the only attorney we knew. He was a friend of ours, but also just happened to be our state representative. And the sitting judge that day just happened to be the judge that swore him into the house. So he went before her and stood before her on our behalf. And to everyone's amazement in the room, the judge placed him back in our home. Hmm. And it was, a, it was a long journey and a long struggle, but eventually um, he became a Vincent. <laughs> and um, he's ours. God made him for us. Mm -hmm. um, our third child, his name is Elisha, mm -hmm. um, the prophet with the double portion, because that was God's double portion to us. Um, Isaiah was only, had only been in our home for two weeks when we got a call from a pastor friend in Montana who had a young girl in his congregation that was 16, pregnant, basically on her own, and she was thinking about adoption. And we were you know, what, God, what are you doing? Um, but we're going to walk through this process until you shut the door and whatever you have for us, we will accept gladly. And even in, until the day she signed the papers giving us um, Elisha, we didn't think it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we knew, we said, if this happens, we know it's God. But she was a brave young girl mm -hmm. and she wanted a better home and a better family mm -hmm for him than she had. Mm -hmm. And so that's how God gave us our three children, our three miracles. And I, I love telling the story because it's his story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. God is our rescuer in all of our lives, but especially right there. Yeah. And I'm so thankful. Yeah. And I'm thankful you guys are here and the difference you're going to make here at Rolling Hills. Thank Thanks so much. Thank you. Blessings. Uh -oh. Great <laughs> job. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thank you. Mm. Oh, church, we're blessed to have Kent and Vonda and their family and um, just on this journey together with them and the way we're going to learn and grow and encourage one another. And so I'm so grateful. Um, the second point is this, is that God delights in you. I want, I want to put up verse 17 on the screen and uh, I want you to see this because this is one of my favorite verses of scripture. It is so 
so good and just rich. And so, in fact, let us read this aloud together. Are you ready? The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that a beautiful passage of scripture? Wow. And notice that it says the Lord your God, personal. Uh, so many times we think, well, God's out there, the God of the universe, the God of creation. And yes, he is. And he is bigger than we can even imagine. But he is also your God, personal God. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. Isn't that great? He's mighty. Not he maybe, not possibly. I mean, he is mighty. He's bigger than anything we face. He's bigger than financial struggles. He's bigger than divorce. He's, he's bigger than health concerns. He's, he's bigger. He is mighty to save. It says he will take great delight in you. Have you ever thought about that? That God takes delight in you? That God made you just the way you are? God not only loves you, newsflash, God likes you. He really does. You're the apple of his eye. You're the joy of his heart. God delights in you. He takes great delight, not a little bit of delight, I mean great delight in you. And I love how it says, right, he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. When Lisa was pregnant with Grace, our first child, and and I remember it was fascinating because her body's changing and all this. And, and, and so here she is, she's pregnant. And, and I used to like sing to, we had already named her Grace in the womb, right? And I would talk to her and I would sing to her. And I'm a terrible singer. Like sometimes I leave my mic on and Chad's like, cut it, cut it, you're throwing us all off, you know? And I mean, it's just, but I love to sing, okay? And so I, and so, I mean, I would just sing to her and sing. And it was just great. Well, we are there in the delivery room and, and here comes Grace out and, and here comes her head. And, and I said, Wow. And when I said, wow, she turned right to me. And the doctor said, did you see that? And I said, wow. And he goes, yeah, she recognized your voice because you've been singing to her, right? You've been talking to her. I was like, yeah, I can't believe that. There were times when she'd be fussy. And what do you do if you're a parent or a grandparent and then the little baby's fussy? What do you do? You wrap them up really tight, right? And you put them there and then you just go back and forth and you're like, shh, it's okay. And to think about a God who does that to us, when we're thrashing about, we're trying to figure out life, when things are going crazy and nuts, and he's just like, hey, hey, hey. He wraps us in those big arms, right? He just puts us there. He goes, shh, it's okay. I got it. I'm bigger. Trust me. Man, that's awesome. I heard a statistic the other day that um, only 4% of women think they're beautiful. And it broke my heart because I live in a house with all girls, right? You know, and I just thought, oh, gosh, they're so beautiful. And I want them to know they're beautiful. But I think so often our perspective is what other people say or what other people think. And what if we had a perspective that just said, God, you love me like this. <laughs> God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God, you know every hair on my head. God, you love me. And I'm beautiful in your eyes. Men, so often we try to find our approval from what other people think, or what our boss thinks, or how we do at work, or what other people in our neighborhood, and yet God just saying, listen, I'm proud of you. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> you know what? You can't do anything that's gonna make me love you anymore, and you can't do anything that's gonna make me love you any less. You're mine. You're my child. You see, what the Old Testament shows us is this, is that God is Father, and God is a perfect Father. And then when we say that God is perfect father, a lot of us, sometimes we kind of go, well, I don't know, because we have this idea of what a father is, and we have this idea of our earthly dad, and, and maybe we had great earthly dads, or maybe we didn't have great earthly dads, but somehow we project that onto God, and God's going, no, 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 listen, I am the perfect father. I, I am the perfect, when you think of what a father should do, and provide, protect, uphold, cheer, encourage. That's what I am. And I want you to know me like that. In fact, it says in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, it says, wow, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. That's not what you received. But you received the spirit of sonship 
And and by him we cry, Abba, Father. That word Abba, it it literally means Daddy. That's the way it's translated. Daddy. We call Abba Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, through Christ, through Christ, we have a relationship with this God of the universe, this huge, mighty God. Through Christ, our sins are taken away and we become sons and daughters of the King. Isn't that amazing? What an awesome truth. Do you ever think about yourself being a son or a daughter of the King of the universe? Do you ever think about you being co-heirs with Christ of the glory that is to come? See, that's what the Old Testament, the Zephaniah and everybody was trying to say to the people, hey guys, you were made for more than this. Don't just have a perspective of what this world has to offer. Lift your head and lift your eyes. Understand who you are. You are a daughter or a son of the king. And he loves you. In Zephaniah chapter 3, the chapter closes out where God says to his people, the sorrows for the appointed feast I will remove from you. And see, back then, all the Jewish men would have to go to three, the annual feast three times a year. So they'd make a trek to Jerusalem. And sometimes it didn't happen. Sometimes it didn't work out. And so they carried around this burden. They carried this guilt. And God's going, listen, listen, listen. i am not come to make you guilty. I've come to offer grace. I've come to offer mercy. Wow. He said, those are a burden, a reproach to you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. This world's not our home, is it? (laughs) We were made for more than this. At that time, I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. When we see the character, we see the nature of a God who's redeeming, a God who's restoring, and the joy and redemption. And you move into the New Testament, you see a God who, who would pay the price of his own son so you and I wouldn't have to live life separated from him. What you see in Jesus Christ is, is God coming to us. And God saying that there's no place you can go that I can't reach. I will send my own son. I love you that much. And even in our sin, even in our struggles, even in our guilt, God doesn't give up on us. So please don't ever give up on yourself because you have a God who won't give up on you. Jesus told a story that really personifies the book of Zephaniah and gives us an even greater revelation of who God is. Jesus said that there was a man, a dad. He had two sons, right? He said that the younger son came to his dad one day and said, Dad, I'm tired of living here at home. In fact, Dad, I'm tired of your rules. Dad, it's my life. I want to do it my way. And so I wish you were dead. Can I just have my inheritance? I'm out. I want to go live life my own way. I want to do my own thing. And Jesus said, the dad, let him go. See, back then, that was a a sin that was punishable by stoning. I mean, you couldn't rebel against your parents. You couldn't disobey your parents like that. But but the dad let him go. He gave him the money. He took off to live his own life apart from the father, away, doing his own decisions, his own things. And he gets out there and he parties it up like a rock star. He's living life, you know, he's with women. He's doing all this kind of thing and all this kind of stuff. And everything is cool until the money runs out. And Jesus said, when the money runs out, the kid finds himself at rock bottom. He ends up feeding pigs, which is like the lowest point for a Jewish boy, right? I mean, he's feeding pigs in a pig pen. And he's there in the pig pen and he's so hungry. He wants to eat the food the pigs are eating. He starts to think about home. He starts to think about dad. He says, even my dad's servants have more than I have right now. Maybe I'll go home. Maybe I'll just say to dad, can I be a servant? So he starts the long trek home. 
not knowing what he's going to find, he rehearses this whole speech. Dad, you know, I've sinned against you. I know I've blown it. I've messed up. And, and he, the whole time he's thinking, you know, he's going to come down on me. He's going to say, I told you so. He's going to say, you're right. You messed up. You blew it. And then Jesus shifts the story over to the dad. And you got this dad who's pacing back and forth on the front porch. Every day he comes out to the front porch. Every day he walks up and down and just looks down the road. Is anybody coming? Is anybody coming home? And one day he sees, he sees a shadow and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And it says this, that, that he runs. Jesus says, God runs. And now back then, people would have been like, what? what are you talking about? A patriarch never runs in this day because if you were to run, you were to hike up your robe and stick it inside your belt. You were to show your legs. It was so disrespectful. You, you wouldn't do it. But the God of the universe, the father runs and he runs and he throws his arms around his son. He embraces him. He starts to just kiss him all over, right? And he's all muddy and there's manure all over him and the dad doesn't care. He's just kissing him, kissing him. And the son pushes him back and says, dad, what are you doing? Stop. Listen, I got the speech, right? I've sinned against you. I've blown it. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And the dad goes, worthy to be called my son? What did you ever do to earn that privilege? And if you didn't do anything to earn it, what can you do to lose it? You are mine. Hey, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Hey, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate because my son who was lost is found. My son who was dead is alive. Let's celebrate. My son has come home. He's come back to me. Let's have a party. See, that's what the Old Testament's about. Just getting us ready. Hey, God loves you so much. And sometimes we go, well, I don't deserve it. You're right, you don't. I don't. And that's why it's called grace. We could never deserve it. We could never be good enough. We could never earn our way there. But we don't have to. God met us and our sin and our depravity when it was yucky and it was messy. God threw his arms around us and said, you are mine through Jesus, my son. The price has been paid. Redemption has come. Salvation is here. You are mine. Do you understand that love? Can you comprehend that grace? Boy, you think that would change the way we live? You think that would change our perspective? You think that would change our worry and our stress and our anxiety? You think that would change as we just said, God, you are my father, my Abba, my redeemer, my savior. And God, my life, may it be a living testimony to your goodness, to your grace, to your mercy, to your love. That's the God of the Bible. <laughs> That's the God that he wants you to know him as father. He wants you to understand God loves you. I don't know where you are today, but I want to invite you just to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And just you and God. Uh, maybe today is a day of salvation, right? Uh, maybe today in your own life, man, you've been far from God. And you know what? It's not an accident at all that you're here today. <laughs> in fact, God's drawing you to himself. He invited you here. He wanted you to hear from him. Uh, maybe today in your own life, it, you just say, there's been other gods that have taken God's place in my life. I mean, I've been running after money or a career or a person or a thing. And today, God's saying, come home. I love you. I believe in you. Maybe for you today, it's just saying, God, I want to understand the depth of that grace. I, I want to see myself in light of the way you see me. Give me a new perspective. Let me know that I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. Let me know that I have your approval. Let me know that I don't have to be afraid because you're bigger than all I face. And Father, right now where we sit, God, we all have different places in life, different places in the journey. But today, God, just corporately, we want to come home come to you, our Father, and define not condemnation, but define grace. 
a God who will throw his arms around us. Say welcome back. So today I pray, Father, for those maybe who've never accepted you, never accepted Christ in their heart and their life, that today they would make that the most important decision of their life. May I pray today, Father, for those who've been in a distant land in a distant country, gotten caught up in the things of the world, and Father, as you draw us to yourself, that we would find our worth and our value in you. I pray today, Father, for those of us that things are going really well, but God, don't let us grow complacent in our walk with you. And so, Lord Jesus, come. Open our eyes to a God who sings over his children, who wraps his big, mighty arms around us, who quiets us with his love, a God who comes to rescue, to delight, to redeem, and to restore. Father, thank you for your presence this morning. And God, we want to respond to you right now. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and we respond. Amen, amen.